pleased to welcome Lauren Mack, the current Associate Director of Career Development at Columbia Journalism School and 2006 graduate from the Journalism School. For the next hour, Lauren will be diving into LinkedIn and teaching us ways to optimize our LinkedIn profiles to find connections and leverage our Columbia alumni network more effectively. After the presentations, we'll take audience questions. You could use the QA, QA, the QA feature at the bottom of your screen to submit questions. We'll get to as many as we can in the time allowed. I am now more than welcome to introduce our presenter of this afternoon, Lauren Mack. Thank you, Sean, and thank you to Columbia Alumni Association uh, for welcoming me here today. And thank you for all of you uh, for joining us. As Sean mentioned, I am a proud graduate of Columbia Journalism School, and I have been a journalist for over 20 years. And I work in the Office of Career Development at Columbia Journalism School, helping uh, journalism students with their career development. So I'm going to share my screen here, and I'm going to go over with you what we're going to discuss today. So first up on the agenda, we're going to just briefly talk about why you need LinkedIn in case some of you aren't convinced about why you need an account. And then I'm going to go over how to optimize your profile. So if you already have an account, how to do that in 10 minutes. Then we're going to talk about how to get noticed and network on LinkedIn. And then I'm going to talk to you about how to leverage the Columbia alumni um, on LinkedIn. Finally, I'll wrap up with some key takeaways and then I'll go over your questions. We did receive a number of questions ahead of time, and we would definitely will go over many of those questions, as well as your questions that you asked today. So you could just put those in the chat, and um, Sean will help me go through all of those. So before we get started, though, I want to take a quick poll of everyone who's here today. If you could all put in the chat for me how many of you have LinkedIn, or you can use the raise your hand feature in Zoom. Let me know if you have a LinkedIn account. And for those of you who don't, I don't want you to feel left out of the conversation in the chat. But if you don't have a LinkedIn account, why is that? If you feel brave enough to tell all of us, why not? All right. So for those of you who don't have an account, uh, I want to go over why you probably should have an account. And for those who've let your account run dormant, here are some reasons, some compelling reasons why you should uh, reactivate and refresh your account. So LinkedIn was launched in 2003, and it's the world's largest professional social media network. There are over 875 million members in 200 countries and regions around the world that are on LinkedIn. More than 52 million people use LinkedIn to search for jobs every single week. And here's an interesting stat. Eight people are hired every single minute on LinkedIn. So now that you know a little bit more about LinkedIn, and I've hopefully convinced you now to revive your, your profile or to sign up for one, let's go over what LinkedIn can do for you. So here are some things that LinkedIn can do for you. One, we all know it to be a place where we can list our experience. Many people often equate it as, as a digital resume, but it's also a place where you can network. And I'm going to spend a bit of time today talking about the importance of connection and networking and how you actually can do that. It's also a great place to build your personal brand and to help your searchability on the internet. So what I mean by that is when someone performs a Google search on you, are you showing up in the search results? And if you are showing up in the search results, what about you is showing up? So by show of hands, or you can put in the chat, how many of you have Googled yourself? It's quite fascinating. If you, if you haven't Googled yourself, I highly recommend doing that. You could do it while we're on today's talk, or you could do it directly after. But I want you to pay attention when you're Googling self, yourself. Are you? What are you finding? Is it a quality search result? If you have a common name, are other people with the same name showing up instead of you? Why is this critical? Why am I spending a few moments talking about searchability? Because when a recruiter is looking to fill a position, they're unlikely to know you by name, but they're going to search characteristics in the type of candidate they're looking for, right? So if they're looking for a content marketer, they're going to search a keyword like content marketer, and you want your name to be one of the thousands of content marketers that show up on the internet. So we'll talk a little bit more in the presentation today about these keywords and how to boost your searchability. 
but LinkedIn is a great way to, to help improve this for yourself. LinkedIn is also a great way to help ourselves make a self-assessment of ourselves and figure out clearly what are our goals and what our objectives are. LinkedIn forces us to sit down and to actually put these in words for folks. It's also a great way to research the competition. Don't we all love to see what other people are doing and compare and contrast ourselves to them? LinkedIn provides a really easy way to do this with filtered searches. It's also for those who are creatives, it's a great way to show an online portfolio of your work without having to build a separate website or presence on the internet. So these are many of the great features of what LinkedIn can do for you beyond just listing your experience. So let's talk a little bit about how to optimize your profile. And for those of you who don't yet have a profile, just make a note of these things so that when you do set up your account, you take these um, specific sections in mind when you're filling out your profile. All of your profile is very important, but there are certain sections where I want you to pay particular extra attention. Before we get down into the individual sections that I want you to pay attention to, I want you to first make a quick assessment. So you could pull this up on your phones or you could do this after today's talk. But I want you to look at your profile and tell me, does your profile look like you are motivated to be found? Now, just having a profile on LinkedIn doesn't mean that you've done everything that you can for your personal branding and that all of your work is done. It's not so much to just have an account, but you also have to make it look dynamic, engaging, and motivating. Think about it when you're out socializing with people, right? You want to approach people who look approachable, who look friendly. The same is true on LinkedIn. So is your profile engaging? Is it interesting? And we're going to talk about this and I'll show you some examples of how to make your profile look engaging and stand out. Also, is your profile complete? You would be surprised at how many people have neglected to put uh, their degree when they've graduated from college. People forget to put certifications or awards that they've received, or they even forget to put their current role. So make sure you go in and make sure your profile is complete and up to date and accurate. So now let me talk about the three sections that I believe are the most critical for making or breaking your account in terms of searchability and noticeability. The first is the headline. So on this slide, you see that I've put an arrow under Kathy's name. She's a recruiter at Google. That is her headline. So when I'm talking about the headline, this is what I'm referring to. Why is the headline important? The headline is important because when recruiters are searching for you on LinkedIn, the first thing they see before they click on your profile is your name and your headline. So this is why it's critical that your headline is filled in, that it's accurate, and that it's appropriate for what you're looking to do on LinkedIn. So for example, if you're in a career transition right now, you would put in your headline, your target industry, like where you're looking to go rather than your current industry. For someone like myself, who's a freelancer, I make it known in my headline that I'm a freelance journalist and that I'm open to work. The next section I want you to pay attention to, so critical, is the about section. The about section or in some people's profiles, this is also called the summary section. What this is, is a blank box for you to describe yourself to the world. Think of this as your handshake. If I go up to you, now we have events in person. If I go up to you in person, you shake my hand, what are the first things that you say to me other than your name? In addition, you could also think of this as your elevator pitch, but whatever approach you take with the about section or the summary section, if you've already written one, I want you to go back and look at it and tell me, is it compelling? Is it, does it have a hook? Does it draw me in? Or do you make me read three or 400 words before you really get into the interesting details about yourself? So in a nutshell, what you're looking to accomplish here in the about section is you want at a minimum to answer three questions. You wanna answer, who are you? What do you do? And what are you looking to do? And this is so critical, especially for those who are transitioning in a career, or maybe you've been out of the workforce for a while, or you're um, just graduated in the last year and you're, you're entering the workforce. You need to make it clear to people what it is that you're looking for and be straightforward, but try to find an interesting and unique way to uh, package that for folks. 
So let me give you some prompts for also, you know, helping you think about this, because I know it's a tall order to tell folks, okay, I need you to optimize your about and your summary section. And a lot of people end up with writer's block. They're like, oh, I just don't know what to say. So here are some prompts other than who are you, what do you do, and what are you looking for? What are you looking to do? So here are some additional prompts I want you to think about. What is your story? What motivates you? An easier one, what are you skilled at? And so important, no matter what industry you are, what value do you bring? Finally, you also can include what's next. So maybe you have a book coming out. Maybe you're speaking at an event like this. Maybe you're attending a conference. You could always put some time sensitive items in there as well. And then, you know, take them out when you no longer, uh, when they're no longer relevant. You want to make sure no matter what, that you're including unique selling points and special skills that are pertinent just to you. LinkedIn is all about customization and personalization, and there's so many filters that recruiters can use to find ideal candidates. So you need to make sure that your profile is keyword rich and has this great density of unique selling points and skills and keywords. This combination is what's going to help you stand out, get noticed, and rank at the top of search so that when a recruiter only has a few minutes to find their ideal candidates, you want your profile to show up front and center. So the last section that I want you to focus on, now I'm not saying not to include the other sections like experience or, or those, and we'll talk about those in a little bit, but another section that I feel needs a lot of attention is the skills section. Why? Because it's not about how long is your resume or how many years of your experience, uh, how many years of experience you have. What is getting folks hired oftentimes is a referral, knowing someone on the inside or someone that can connect you to someone on the inside and skills. Why are skills important? Because when a recruiter is looking for an ideal candidate, no matter the industry, they want to know that from day one, you can hit the ground running, you can do your job efficiently, effectively, that you can be someone that they can rely upon and is like results oriented. You demonstrate this through your skills. You can list up to 50 skills in LinkedIn and I know for a lot of people that sounds, wow, like that's a lot of skills. You know, a lot of people will just put on a resume somewhere between, you know, half a dozen or a dozen skills. But LinkedIn has a whole um, list that you can select from. So I encourage you to go through the list and you might see skills there that you didn't think uh, to put, especially soft skills. Uh, a lot of times those count just as much as a more straightforward skill, like the ability to know a coding language or to... Um, you know, speak other languages. So I highly encourage you today to go through, look at the skills, and I encourage you to try to get to 50. You might be surprised at how many skills you didn't know that you had that are truly marketable. So let's talk about how to get noticed. A lot of folks sent questions in advance, asked over and over again, how do I get noticed? How do I get the recruiters to pay attention to me? How do I become a thought leader? How do I get traction? How do I build my brand? How do I build my audience? So all of these things are um, requ require you to get noticed, right? So it doesn't serve you to spend hours and hours and hours uh, on your profile. You shouldn't have to spend too many hours once you get it set up initially, but it doesn't make any sense to spend all this time thinking about yourself and working on your branding if you're not gonna get noticed. So the way you get noticed, I'm going to give you some strategies for this um, to help you build your brand. So the first, so these are some quick little things that you can do in less than five minutes. And it might seem like it's not going to yield uh, the results that you want, but it really does make a difference. So just like in real life, first impressions matter, right? How you dress, how you present yourself, how you carry yourself. These are all important. So in the digital space, the way you, you can achieve some of these things is through the aesthetics and the little details in your profile that add up to have a big impact over time. So in the example I'm showing here, Bianca Konsunji, she's a grad of the J School. You see she has her profile photo, which we're all familiar with. It's professional looking. You don't need a professionally shot headshot. You don't need to spend a lot of money on the headshot. You just need something that makes you look uh, good, 
that's flattering in nice lighting, preferably dressed um, in a nice way or a tight shot like hers. Um, so just good lighting. You can have your friends take it on their phone. It's really easy to do that nowadays. But what I want you to also include is the background photo. You see here, it shows her out in the field. She's a, a documentarian, a video, a visual storyteller. And so this background photo is a way to give an insight to folks a little bit more about your personality or the work that you do. They're seeing you out in the field. The next thing you should consider doing is adding um, a video introduction. And so I'm gonna switch my screen here. So you can see on Andrew here, he is also a grad of the journalism school. Um, when you click on his photo, it launches a quick video. And I'm going to stop sharing for a second because I'm going to reshare my screen. And I'm gonna play for you his very, very, very short video. Just one second here. And remember, um, we will be doing questions. So um, please make sure you're putting those in the chat and Sean is going to be collecting those for me. All right, so when you come to someone's account or someone's profile that has the video introduction, it's gonna be right here. You'll just click the photo and then I'm gonna let you listen to his quick video. Hi everyone, my name is Andrew Seaman. I'm LinkedIn Senior News Editor for Job Searches and Careers. I'm one of more than 75 editors around the world that LinkedIn employs to give you the news and views you need to talk about the things that matter. So if you wanna know the latest in job searching and career news, be sure to follow me. So you can see it's very short, it's very succinct, but you get a little bit of um, Andrew's personality, which I like, it humanizes your profile. It's a nice touch, especially since so many people are still working remotely and we crave this um, interpersonal interaction. This is just a nice touch, um, a nice warm greeting, but it also helps you stand out because not that many people are using this feature. So the way you add this feature to your profile is you need to use the LinkedIn app on your phone. When you launch it, there is... Um, when you launch it, you go to your profile. Underneath your photo, you'll see a little plus sign. When you click on that, it's going to ask you, do you wanna add a photo or do you wanna add a video greeting? If you select video greeting, it's going to launch a video recorder that's gonna record the video and then publish it um, straight to LinkedIn. Of course, you can preview it before you post it. You can take as many takes as you want, but just something to consider adding. The other thing that I like is you can add pronunciation. So if your name is difficult to pronounce or you find that folks um, often jumble your name, you can do a voice recording also from your phone using the LinkedIn app. It uses the voice recorder, uh, the memo on your phone, and it will record you pronouncing your name. You can also add pronouns if you'd like. So this is something that's really easy to do as well. You just go into your settings, um, at the very top, there is a there will be a pencil here where you see the bell, and then a pop up window comes up, and you're able to either select from some pre selections for pronouns, or you can customize them and make them your very own. Another thing that I highly recommend everyone do. So if you if you avoid the first few things that I've just told you, the one thing that you definitely should do is get what's called a vanity URL, and you can see that here. What is a vanity URL? A vanity URL is when you get an account on LinkedIn, by default, it will be linkedin.com backslash IN backslash a bunch of letters and numbers that are meaningless to you and me. You can replace all of that jumbled letters and numbers with words. So in this case, I've used my name backwards uh, just because someone else, someone else called Lauren Mack already took Lauren Mack. So I had to put my name backwards. But for all of you, I suggest your name because this is gonna help not only help you rank higher in search on LinkedIn, but it's also gonna help you rank higher in search on Google, Bing, Yahoo, and so on. So it's just an extension of helping your personal branding. And from an aesthetic standpoint, it also looks a lot cleaner on a resume, which is where you should put your LinkedIn profile. Should also have your LinkedIn profile in your email signature. And for those of you um, who may still be using business cards, which a lot of people still use, you could also consider putting your LinkedIn profile there. And what's nice about having the vanity, it's very easy to type. So let's get into uh, how to network, because this is something that uh, folks ask all the time. And I think it's something that we all 
um, to some level struggle with at times uh, to be motivated to network and then also just like the logistics of how to actually network. So the first thing to do for networking, if you haven't already, is to connect with the Columbia University page on LinkedIn. Um, yes, we're all alums or students of Columbia, so this, this seems like a no-brainer, but you'd be surprised at how many folks are not connected. So first stop after today's talk is to go to the Columbia University LinkedIn page and go ahead and um, add that for yourself. The next thing to do for networking is to follow influencers on LinkedIn. So just like we have influencers on Instagram and influencers on TikTok, LinkedIn has its very own influencer base as well. These tend to be um, high achievers in all kinds of industries. So you could see examples here of the folks that have the most influence currently on LinkedIn. So I'm not suggesting you necessarily follow these folks, but it's just giving you an example of the types of influencers that you can follow and emulate. And then hopefully you can uh, use some of the strategies I teach you today to become an influencer in your own industries and in your own networks as well. Another thing to do is to join the Columbia Alumni Association Network. It is different and separate and distinct from the Columbia University LinkedIn page. The difference, the key difference here is that the CAA network is a group on LinkedIn. So this is a private group. So the only way to join is, is to join, opt into the group. And then, the, then you can see all of the posts and the conversations. And then once you've joined and you're, you're, you've been accepted, I encourage you to, if you feel brave enough, you can introduce yourself, let folks know who you are. You can start off by, you know, which school you graduated from. You could, you know, maybe talk about what you're doing uh, or what you're looking to do. And you never know. Alums are always in here engaging with one another and they might just want to engage with you. It's also a great place to keep up to date on events like this, um, but as well as what's going on at the university and what's going on among alumni. The next thing um, that you should do to build your network is to post on LinkedIn. So just if you're on other social media, you are aware of how this works. So on Twitter, we would compose a tweet. On Facebook, we make a post. The same on LinkedIn. The difference here is that LinkedIn is all about careers and it's all professional related. So we don't post things like uh, selfies or rants or um, pictures of our dogs or you know our vacation or private things. Instead, what we're posting here are either um, significant milestones. In this case, Gabriella graduated from Columbia University. And so she posted a picture of herself on campus in her graduation attire um, and thanking all of her supporters and letting everyone know that she's now going to go pursue um, an advanced degree. You can also post uh, other things that you can post about um, things that you've read, like thought leadership, you can comment on those things. You can reshare important articles about things happening in your network or in industry. You can also generate your own content as well. So if you're someone who's a researcher, uh, you can share some of the groundbreaking research that you're doing. So there's lots of opportunities when it comes to activities, but the more you can post, the better um, it will help in terms of making an impactful um, profile and network on LinkedIn. Another way to um, network is to go to events. So it, now that there's a lot of events virtually, so it's really easy no matter where we are in the world, but also um, we're now having events in person again, right? Including alumni uh, events all over the world. And so don't forget the power of in-person networking. So offering to take people out for a coffee, or maybe you wanna have a virtual chat online with folks. And no matter who you meet, right? In, whether it's in real life, if, whether it's virtually, whether you meet them at a conference or they're sitting next to you in class, these are folks that you might consider inviting to connect with you on LinkedIn. So no matter how you meet folks, when you meet them, I always suggest following up with them as close to the interaction, the initial interaction as possible. And one of the best ways to stay connected with folks is through LinkedIn. So if you're a current student now, I encourage you to set up a LinkedIn profile and connect with um, classmates, professors, internship supervisors, fellowship advisors, mentors, all the people in your circle now so that you can keep, um, you can keep them in your network 
for years to come. So that five years, 10 years from now, you, you will see how fast um, and how vast your network has become. It's really important when networking to have the mindset of the long game, right? Networking isn't something, um, it's something we have to constantly be working on and, and building little by little. It's really important to build a network when you don't need one so that when you do need one later on, they're already there for you and you can quickly go and ask people for help. So like if you if you've just graduated from school or you've been in the industry for a couple of years, start building your network now because you never know if you're going to need to take time off in the future, if you're going to be unfortunately laid off in the future, right? And when those things happen in life, when these life events happen whether they're planned or not, you can then immediately go to turn to your network either publicly or privately whether um, in a vast way or in a one-to-one -one nature to seek out the help and support that you need. And likewise, you can also pay it forward to other folks. So some quick quick key takeaways, and then I'm going to get to um, some of the questions that we will start with some of the questions we received ahead of time. Um, and then um, Sean will also be uh, conveying to me the questions in the chat, keep those coming, we appreciate them. Um, but some key takeaways. So LinkedIn isn't obviously the only way to network. It's not the only um, digital presence that you could, should consider having. So depending on your industry, you may want to also have an online portfolio. You may want to have a GitHub. You may want to have a personal website, or you may just want to rely on LinkedIn. You also want to always keep your profile updated. So the way I do this, because life just seems to always, time always seems to fly by. What I do is I set an alert on my phone um, and I set it for once a month. It's like a little meeting that I set with myself for 15 minutes and it just reminds me to go to my LinkedIn profile and make sure everything is up to date. You can also just remind yourself, you know, every, let's say every Friday you go to the bank, right? So every day when, every Friday, when you go to the bank and you're standing in line having to wait, maybe that's an opportunity for you to update something on LinkedIn or to make a quick post about what's going on professionally for you. Definitely make a vanity LinkedIn URL, make an appointment with yourself, take the 30 seconds to do that. Um, and then put that LinkedIn URL everywhere. Put it in your email signature, put it on your resume. Um, it's really important. Uh, I encourage folks to add the pronunciation and those um, virtual greetings to your profiles, again, to help you stand out. And it's really important to figure out a way to make status updates on LinkedIn. So posting, even if it's once a month or even once a quarter, four times a year, right? You want the profile to look lived in, that the lights are on and that you're there, that you're present, that you're engaged. Even if you feel, I don't really have the time to do this, everyone has five minutes, four times a year to go on LinkedIn and to figure out something to say or to reshare an article of importance or to celebrate the achievements of others by liking and commenting. You just want the appearance that you are engaged, that you're all in on LinkedIn, even if the reality is you're only spending a few minutes a month or a year on it. And then constantly be working your network, constantly be building your network. Every, every time we are out in the world is an opportunity to network. So whether you're standing in line at the bookstore here at Columbia to buy textbooks, you could always turn to the folks around you, look up from your phone, look around and say, hello, strike up a conversation or come to an alumni event. Because the one thing that um, I think a lot of us struggle with is going into a room where we feel like we don't know anyone and, and, and there are hundreds of people in the room and, and how do you break in and start a conversation? It starts with that first extension of the hand or elbow to um, you know, introduce yourself to someone. What I like to do is when I go to events, when I was starting out with networking, I was very intimidated by the process. So I would set micro goals for myself. I would go to um, a CAA event and what I would do is I would tell myself, I have to say hello and introduce myself to three people. And then I can either go back to looking at my phone or leave, right? Depending on what kind of event it was. And I, what I found was that I would start with one conversation and that would lead to another and it would lead to another. And before I knew it, I'd been talking to people, you know, for over an hour. And as I went to more and more events, I found this to be a much easier, natural, less anxiety inducing situation because like anything, practice makes perfect, right? And, and who doesn't like, you know, a warm smile in a crowded room of strangers. So be that person for someone else as well.
So now we're going to go to the many amazing questions that you all sent. So the first set, there were a lot of questions about career transition. So understandably, during the, the pandemic, a lot of us found ourselves reevaluating um, you know, the work that we do and the, the work-life balance that we seek and our priorities have shifted. Um, a lot of folks just naturally in, in the course of time, they've taken time out to, to be caretakers or take a mental health break. For whatever reason, um, a lot of people, or maybe you just discover you have a newfound passion for a different industry. So when it comes to career transitions, a lot of the questions folks asked were, you know, how do you use um, LinkedIn to, to, to jump from one industry to another, especially when they aren't um, close neighbors or, or close um, in, in industry type? Um, and so I'm going to give you some, some strategies, uh, for that. Um, and also this also applies to folks doing middle age. Uh, some folks also spoke about how they're doing like, um, a pivot, whether it's in their early career or late career or, or whatnot. So let's talk about, um, transitioning. So whether you're going to transition, you know, from teaching to public health, or you're going to transition from law to journalism, um, this is what you can do. So the first thing is, and I'll stop sharing my screen so you can actually see me. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to put your target industry in your headline. So right under your name on LinkedIn, you're going to go to the pencil and you're going to put in your industry, the industry that you're seeking. Why? Because when a recruiter searches for you, if you keep your old um, career there, that's going to confuse recruiters. They're going to see, oh, this, this person is still a lawyer. And instead, you want to put that you want to be a journalist if that's the pivot that you're making. You have up to 220 characters in the headline. Um, and so you want to take advantage of those characters to be able to pepper in some keywords, to be able to add some skills in there, to, sh to be able to demonstrate to folks the direction you're going in. So don't look to the past or even the present. Look to the future when you're looking to make those pivots. You also want to think about any relevant certifications or licensure that you either have or you are getting so that you can make that pivot, especially like, let's say you're gonna go work in, um, you wanna go into HR role, recruiting role, then you can go pretty quickly and get certified. And then you can put that certification in your headline. You can also put that in your skills section. There's also a section for licenses. The other thing that you can do is in your experience section, in your about section, you can talk about transferable skills, especially um, even those who are who have taken a time out, maybe you've been a caretaker or things like that. There are lots of skills even in those um, activities of life that are transferable. For example, if you're a caretaker, you have to budget and you have to do time management. And these are skills that are important in many different roles. When it comes to your experience what you in, in the about section, what you want to do is in the first part of the about section, you want to focus on the most relevant skills from your past that are going to help in the industry or role you are seeking. You want to front load those. So even if that's only 10% of your current job, you want to front load the about section with that so that when the recruiter starts reading your profile, they're not going to see all the stuff that's irrelevant and then just say this person's not a candidate for this role or lacks experience. Instead, what they're seeing is that you front loaded the experience and the skill sets that you have so that it's going to keep them reading. And then they're going to realize that you're doing a career pivot, but they're not going to take you out of, out of the running. They're going to give you the time of day to scroll through your um, profile. In addition, what you want to do is in the experience section, you want to demonstrate how you add value. So tailor the description of what you're doing in those roles or what you did in the past um, to demonstrate your ability to achieve relevant results in the new role and in the new industry. So always telling people how you're going to add value is really impactful. Um, and that's going to help you, especially if you have zero experience into what you're looking to do. You also want to make sure you have relevant keywords for this new target role or industry. So for example, if you want to be a brand manager, you need to add keywords like brand management marketing, digital media, market analysis, like those need to be in the profile, in the about section, in the experience section, you need to work those in as well as, as best that you can. 
Again, add certifications and licenses or go seek those if you have the ability to. Um, you may not have worked in this role or industry before, but you have an idea about the trends, the challenges, and the opportunities in this new industry that you're going into. So use that as an opportunity. You can leverage that in your posts that you're making on LinkedIn. You can follow um, industry news and you can make comments on it so that people know, okay, you're educated about what's going on in that industry. If you need skills, if you need, if you're looking at job descriptions in the target market and you feel like you either don't have the right skill set or you're lacking in those skills, you can turn to LinkedIn Learning, Coursera, Udemy, lots of different platforms today where you can go get training and quickly earn those certifications from the comfort of your home. And finally, you can add skills. So again, you have up to 50 skills. Make sure you're adding relevant key skills to that industry or target job. And again, Find ways in the activity section by posting about your thoughts, your views, um, and your ideas as a professional. Uh, when you show that you're active on LinkedIn, it helps you stand out from the crowd and it strengthens your personal brand. And these are all things that are appealing to recruiters. So some examples of how to do this, because people are always like, well, Lauren, you say to post, but like, I really don't know what to post. So here is your editorial calendar, if you will. Okay. So what you can do is you can engage with some industry experts, um, you know, comment on the things that they're writing about or the articles that they're sharing. Um, you can share content again that you're reading. You can subscribe to newsletters, join relevant groups on LinkedIn to quickly become an authority and then share that out to your community. Sean, do you want to go to a live question or should we go to another one that's been sent ahead of time? Yeah, I think we could um, go to some live questions real quick. Sure. Um, I'll start with a comment that was made, which I think we're all thinking, Lauren, what a fantastic instructor speaker you are. Oh, thank, thank you, you. For, um, for being with us today. Um, I have a question from um, Annette, Wu, who's a current CAA board member and good friend of mine. Is there a copyright issue if you post an article in LinkedIn that you read? Uh, to my knowledge, no. So anything, you know, that you're pulling from, let's say the New York times, the Washington post box vice, whatnot, those media companies want people to click on the stories and want you to share their content. So as long as you're not copy pasting the whole article and then republishing it as if it were your own, um, there's no issue, um, that I have heard of with sharing the links to articles and, you know, putting your comments on top. All right, thank you for that answer. I have another sure. question from Hannah Wesley. How do you go about revamping your profile and activity on LinkedIn without raising suspicion from your current employer or colleagues? Yes. Okay. Yeah, because that's awkward, right? Like if if on Friday your profile looks like you haven't logged in in years, and then on Monday it suddenly <laughs> has all these bells and whistles. Definitely, uh, for those who are really paying attention on LinkedIn, might arouse some suspicion. So. I say do it little by little, right? So even if you're, let's say you're in a current role now and you're job hunting, right? Obviously time for many people is of the essence when doing that, but maybe just do some light changes like every single day, like to change two or three things. And then if someone asks you, you can say, well, I went to this CIA le leveraging LinkedIn presentation and they gave me all these tips and I set aside time and I'm just working on my personal branding. So fortunately for you, you have this event that you can blame. Um, <laughs> for why your profile is looking uh, so great these days. But I would just say do it little by little. So then that way it's a little more um, discreet. Um, a quick note, because it was asked by someone else, when you are applying for jobs, can your employer or the public see that? And, and the answer is no. So if you're applying for a job on LinkedIn, like you see a job you want and you hit the easy apply button, there's no status update that goes out to the world that says, hey, this person just applied for this job. So so don't worry um, about that. Um, one of the questions I received, Sean, ahead of time was what is creator mode? And so I'm going to share my screen because I do want to show people um, what that is. Let me just pull it up on, um, on my account. So creator mode is something that's available to everyone on LinkedIn. So whether you have a free account or a paid account, creator mode is a profile setting in your dashboard that can help you grow your reach. So for a lot of you who are trying to grow your reach and influence on um, LinkedIn. So what you're, what you're going to 
do if you want to um, to add this. Actually, I already have it on mine. So it's going to be here under research. So this is my profile. We're looking at the back end of my profile. So you're logged in as me. So you're going to scroll down here to where it says resources. Okay. And the first thing you're going to see cre is creator mode. And you can see that mine is on. So let me talk to you about what this does. So what this does is if you go to my LinkedIn profile now um, on the front end, you can see the button that says connect. But when I have creator mode on, it will change to follow, not connect. You can still add a connection request and, and seek to connect with me, but by default, what it's going to do while you're waiting for my connection request is it's going to have you be one of my followers. So if you see here, I have 514 followers, but only 461 connections, right? So all the people following me are not necessarily connected to me. So that's one key difference in creator mm. mode is you can gain like tens of thousands of followers, but maybe you only want a few connections. Because remember, when you're connected with people on LinkedIn, these should be people that you know, right? Not randoms. It's not like Instagram or TikTok where it's all about give me as many followers as possible. I don't need to know any of you, right? In LinkedIn, when I'm connected to you, it means that I'm vouching for you as a professional, like, this is my word that you are, you are like a, a valued member in your industry that you are, you know, a go-getter. It's almost like recommending people in a way, right? Whereas followers are just people who are interested in the content um, that I produce. The other thing is, um, the other thing is um, if you decline to connect with people, because I get a lot of connection requests, just like a lot of you do as well. Um, if I decline those requests or just ignore them, the person will stay as a follower. Now they can also choose to unfollow me. They can say, well, she never connected with me. So I don't want to follow her anymore. So they could just go in and unfollow me. But just so you know, it's, it's, they would have to manually unfollow you. The other thing is you can add hashtags about the topics that you are writing about that you are commenting on in your activity section. It kind of gives insight into like what you're about. So for me as a journalist, this is really important. I have hashtags for my um, for my beats. So I cover travel and food. Those are my beats. But I'm also described by many people, whether I like it or not, as a blogger, right? Um, as well as a journalist. So you can choose some hashtags here that will appear in your profile so that when you know PR folks or, or folks from the public are coming to my profile and they want to know what kind of journalist I am, they can quickly see what kind of journalist I am and decide whether I'm worth uh, the follow or the connection. It's also a way for people to discover your content as well. When you put on creator mode, LinkedIn will also highlight any original content that you create. So LinkedIn also has uh, the ability to publish blog posts or thought leadership on their platform. You can also do audio, you can do live events, um, and some people can do newsletters if you have creator mode turned on. Um, so when you have creator mode turned on, LinkedIn is more likely to highlight you over other users. So that's going to also grow, um, you know, your following. It also, um, it also allows you to add a link here in your profile. So you see on my profile, I have my own personal website as well as uh, LinkedIn to help extend my brand when people are searching for me by name on the internet. So when you have creator mode on, you're able to add this one URL, um, which is nice. Um, you also become eligible, eligible, I should say, to be featured as a, um, as a, as a suggested person for other LinkedIn people to follow. So that's also going to help grow your network and grow your influence. Um, like I said, you can also do LinkedIn Live, which are, are live events kind of like this. Um, you can also do a newsletter, but you have to meet certain criteria as deemed by LinkedIn. So let me tell you what that criteria is. You need to have an audience of more than 150 followers. So that number here. So it shouldn't take most of you too long to get that many followers, but it could take you anywhere from a couple of months to you know a year or more. You, um, you also need to have um, some recent shares on LinkedIn of, of any um, of content or you, whether it's things that you have produced or content that you're sharing. Basically, you have to look like you're active. And then yeah, a history of what they say, abiding by LinkedIn's professional community policies, which just basically means 
you're a decent human and you're not violating any of the rules on, on LinkedIn. That's how they determine that you're a decent person. Um, so yeah. So um, the way you know if you these tools are available to you, what you'll do is when you click on creator mode, so if some of you have turned this on now, if you've been inspired during my talk, you can toggle it on and off also, so you don't, you don't have to be stuck with it. But if you come down here, it's going to show you which tools are available. So you can see that I've been approved for all four um, tool types. So again, to turn it on, what you're going to do is just go to your profile, scroll down to resources, and then you can click um, creator um, mode and then uh, toggle it on. Another question, and then I'll go to one that you have, Sean, is, is LinkedIn premium worth it? So you can see um, I have LinkedIn premium. I don't have it all the time. So um, I use it a couple of times a year or in different parts of my career, like especially if I'm job hunting. Um, some of you, if you're on the job hunt now, you may find it worth it. Um, but I'm not, this is not an endorsement to go out and get LinkedIn premium. But let me tell you what um, LinkedIn premium gives you beyond the basic account. So there are multiple different kinds of LinkedIn premium accounts that you can get. So what happens is when you click the button to say upgrade, LinkedIn is going to ask you a series of questions. Based on your answers, they're going to present to you a variety of plan choices, and each plan choice has its own pricing tier. You can also overwrite the LinkedIn suggestions and choose any um, plan that you want. Um, so what it does that, um, that the regular account doesn't, you can find and contact anyone on LinkedIn, whether they're in your network or not. So um, this could be potentially useful for people if you have a very small network and you're trying to expand it. Um, what I like is you can see who has viewed your profile. So in the last 90 days, you can see who's looking at your profile, if, whether they're people that are known to you or not. And then it kind of gives you insight into like who your audience is or potential connections. You also get access to what's called in-mail. So these are private email messages that you can send or direct messages that you can send through LinkedIn. You get a certain number of these depending on the premium subscription that you have. So for example, my subscription allows me to send five in-mails a month to people that I don't know on LinkedIn. If I know you on LinkedIn, like if we're connected, I can send you mail with no problem. Um, you can also, um, uh, let's see. Oh, the other thing is in addition to seeing who has looked at your profile, when you are looking on LinkedIn and I click on people's profiles, like if I go to Sean's account and I click on him, I'm going to show up as someone who looked at Sean's account. But if I don't want Sean to know that I was looking at his account, if I have premium, I can be in like incognito mode. So basically what will happen is like right now I'm in that mode. So if Sean were, if I were to go to Sean's account, when he clicks on it, it'll just say somebody who works at Columbia University looked at your profile or Columbia Journalism School rather, looked at your profile. There are hundreds of people who work at Columbia Journalism School and at the university. So Sean, it's probably gonna be hard for him to guess that it was actually me. So this is sometimes um, useful, particularly like if you're trying to get the inside scoop on maybe like the CEO at your company or things like that, and you don't want them to know that you've been looking around um, at, the, at the higher ups in the company, you can do this um, safely and security, you know, unless you work at a very small company, which then they might be able to guess that it's you. Um, the other thing is um, you get company insights. So let me show you how that looks. So let's say, for example, I want to go work at the New York Times. With a premium account, I am going to be able to get company background information. So it's going to save me time when I'm researching companies. So right here, there's an insights tab that shows up when you have premium. And you can see here, it's also always tagged premium so that you know that this is something that you're only getting because you pay for the subscription. So right here, I get how many employees. I get an employee profile of the New York Times. I get insights into um, the headcount and growth over time. Like is the company laying off a bunch of people or are they hiring people? Like what's the trend in hiring? Um, and I can see some data about new hires. And I can also see who has worked at the company in the past that, that, that is deemed by LinkedIn's algorithm to be notable people. Not, that's not necessarily still working there. If you click on the um, 
a little question mark. They define what this is. Uh, and then you can see like how many job openings are currently there. And they give you like this nice little pie chart breakdown. So you get this nice data, which is really nice. Um, you also get salary insights. So this is useful. Like if you see a job posting, so let's see, for example, this doesn't work for every company. And this really frustrates me about premium. So let's say, for example, we're going to look at this deals writer um, job, right? So everyone who has LinkedIn can see this, they can see the description, but what everyone doesn't get, unless you have premium here is where you stand in the potential applicant pool. So right here, it shows that I'm in the top 50% of, of this many applicants who have already applied for this job. Now, it doesn't mean there aren't applicants from other sources, but these are people who applied through LinkedIn or, you know, like they've been able to track those applications. Um, and then they can give you some profile of what your competition looks like. So you're getting insight into who else has applied for this job. So you could see how you stack up, not only, you know, education wise and geographic wise, but also in skill sets. And it indicates to you here why it says that I'm in the top 50%, like which of my specific skills um, have been deemed. So this is also useful. Like if you're transitioning careers, you can see like where you need to fill in the gaps um, skill set wise. Um, it also is supposed to have uh, salary, but it doesn't always have that. And that's the frustrating thing. So usually if they have the salary insight, they'll give you a range. Now in New York state, there's a law now where people have to give the range. Um, so maybe this is going to be less important for LinkedIn, or maybe their tool is going to get better, but that is one thing, um, that I feel like the premium is lacking. So, uh, so that's premium in a nutshell. Oh, let me give you some advice for how to get premium for free because who wants to pay for stuff? Because LinkedIn is expensive. Like it's like $39.99 a month. Like why pay that when you can get it for free? So here are some ways. Oh, and you also get access to LinkedIn learning. So you get 16,000 different courses, but here's how you can get it for free. First of all, you can try it for free for 30 days, right? Okay. But maybe that's not sufficient for most of us. If you are a U.S. military veteran or the spouse of a U.S. military veteran, you can get LinkedIn premium for free for one year. And I'll give the links, um, to Sean and Natalie, they can, they can um, uh, share those with all of you. If you have an Amazon Prime student account, you can get LinkedIn premium for free for six months. And um, Sean, I think I gave you the link for that. If you are a journalist like me, you can apply. So it's not guaranteed, but you can apply for LinkedIn for journalists, which offers one year of free LinkedIn premium membership, but you have to go to a webinar in order to get it. And you have to fill out a very brief application. The application takes five minutes to fill out. It's really easy. Um, and they only take that seasonally. Um, some folks in LinkedIn itself who work for LinkedIn, they get a number of free premium subscriptions a year that they can give out. So if you go into the search bar of LinkedIn and you search hashtag LinkedIn premium or hashtag plus one pledge. So P-L-U-S-O-N-E pledge and hit enter. You're going to, and then filter the search so that it shows you the most recent posts. You'll see people who have posted on their account. Hey, I have one free subscription to give away, or I have three free subscriptions to give away. Um, so that is some tips for not having to pay for LinkedIn. You also might check with your own individual employers as well, because some employers also uh, provide this as a benefit to their company or a reimbursement. So Sean, how about some live oh. questions? Like, should we have like, yeah, we have, um, like time for one left, right? Yeah, I think we're, we're just about out of time, Lauren. You um, provide us with so much good insights and details and, and tools and resources to really revamp all of our LinkedIn profiles. Um, if we had a, if we're a live audience, you'd get a standing ovation right now. So thank you so much for joining us today and, and for your time. Um, if everyone can please just mark your calendars, our next Columbia at Home event will be on December 7th. Um, so keep an eye out for our alumni newsletter and visit us at alumni.columbia.edu for the most up-to-date information on events and anything else that we have going on at the Columbia Alumni Association within your alumni community. Um, thank you all for attending from overseas, nationally, across the um, country. Um, have a, a great and safe day and be well. Thank you.